um, as we get started. And I do just want to um, take the opportunity to thank you for, for joining us this afternoon to talk a little bit more um, <coughs> um, about home energy use and renewable energy. Today is the second in a series, um, the Climate Smart Floridians curriculum. And my name is Alyssa Vinson. I'm the residential horticulture agent in Manatee County. And this webinar is offered through our um, local library. And I'm going to hand it over to Eileen Valdez so she can introduce um, herself and talk a little bit about the library program. And then we'll go ahead and get into the meat of today's presentation. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, again, I'm Eileen Valdez with the Manatee County Public Library System. I'm the assistant supervisor at the Palmetto Library. Um, again, thank you, Alyssa, for um, um, what I'm sure is going to be another wonderful and informative session um, as part of the Climate Smart, Smart Floridian series. Um, this is, as Alyssa said, class two. We have four more to go, um, but you don't have to have watched any of the other ones or have been part of any of the other ones to understand anything going in those um, and hopefully we will continue offering more of these um, zoom programs with extension services um, the libraries in Manatee County are open we are still at 40 percent capacity um, at each of our locations but um, we're kind of plugging along and hopefully um, every week we can kind of go up in our capacity uh, we're offering a lot of different zoom programs uh, for all ages as well as um, recordings of things on our our um, YouTube page or our YouTube channel, Manatee Libraries. Um, so yep, continue to check on there for uh, any new programs and information. And I'll give it over to Alyssa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eileen. And we really do um, <clears throat> appreciate the opportunity to uh, co-promote these, these webinars with the library system. Um, again, my name is Alyssa Vincent, and I'm the residential horticulture agent for the Manatee County Extension Office. And if you didn't join us last week, I do want to take the opportunity just briefly to talk to you about what Extension is. Um, we are an extension of the University of Florida, which is one of Florida's two land-grant universities. Um, we provide research-based education um, to create social, economic, and, <clears throat> and environmental um, impacts for Florida citizens, ideally enhancing your quality of life through the information that we're able to provide to you in an accessible format, right? That's, that's part of our goal as Extension is to take the information and the research that's conducted at the university level and make it accessible to folks um, and, and some something that they can implement in their everyday life. Each Florida County has an extension office um, and you can find yours at the uh, extension office interactive map here. In Manatee County, our extension office has direct impacts in these four areas that I'm going to highlight right now. Um, talking about over $2 million in value for new licenses and CEUs provided to pesticide license holders in Manatee County, over $860,000 of value and volunteer time um, educating Manatee County citizens through extension programs. And, and this is really, um, we have a, a robust volunteer program in our Master Gardener program where we have over 109 individuals who participate in that program, as well as our 4 volunteers and various other volunteers through Manatee County. The 4-H program as well as other um, programs in our office are responsible for educating over 28,000 youth in our community and we've saved over 14 million gallons of water for Manatee County Utilities customers through some of our programs that we offer. So I just wanted to take an opportunity to highlight some of those local impacts and then um, just explain what Climate Smart is. Climate Smart um, is actually a curriculum that was developed by the University of Florida's Sea Grant Climate Work Action Team. And the goal is to just increase climate literacy and then ultimately reduce local greenhouse gas emissions at the household level. So it's providing information to the general public based on the available research that can allow people to both save money, save electricity, and ultimately save greenhouse gases at the local level. <laughs> Today's discussion is going to focus on home energy use. So we're going to talk about how energy is used in our homes, how you can save some money and greenhouse gases. 
um, what renewable energy is, what, you know, what we consider renewable energy, um, some different tax credits and rebates that are available, as well as a brief discussion on biofuels. Something to remember from our class last week where we kind of set the stage for what is climate change um, is to remember that greenhouse gases, right, we talk about reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, and greenhouse gases are, are those gases that are going to trap heat in the atmosphere and, and increase our risk um, for, for global climate change. And one of the things that I think is important for us to recognize that we talked about last week is that there's a certain amount of climate change that's already baked into the system because of how much CO2 and how many other uh, of the other types of greenhouse gases that we've released into the atmosphere. So to a certain extent, we're going to have to adapt our lives to accommodate that change in our climate. And so some, um, some actions that we take individually are going to need to be adaptation actions. But some of those we can still mitigate potentially um, future complications related to climate change by taking mitigation actions now. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, we're going to be talking about how we can take some of these mitigation actions with our home energy usage. So I want to start just by um, <clears throat> talking about kind of what um, how influential our home energy use is in the grand scheme of things, right? So if we look at in 2014, households accounted for almost 22% of the total energy consumption in the US. And that's an estimated release of over 21,000 pounds of, of CO2. So, you know, that, that's, in, that's in 2014. Um, and, you know, that, that's almost a quarter of our, of our entire energy use in the United States is just for household consumption. So that's more than two times the amount of carbon dioxide released than an average car per year. So we talk a lot about ways to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions through transportation changes and getting you know, more energy efficient vehicles. But we talk less about the actions we can take in our homes um, and how influential those can be in reducing greenhouse gases. <coughs> The impact of um, your home energy use on uh, the amount of CO2 is going to depend somewhat on where your local electrical utility gets their energy, right? So do you live in a region where um, there's a large percentage of solar uh, or is it mostly natural gas? Is it mostly coal? Is it mostly oil? Is there some nuclear mi mixed in there? Um, here in Florida, up until about 10 years ago, about 15% of the energy usage for the Tampa Bay area was from nuclear. Um, but that plant has been since um, shut down and isn't being used to produce electricity anymore. So um, we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about where we get our energy uh, in a little bit. So as far as what things we use electricity for in our homes, um, if you look here, this is um, from uh, the Energy Information Administration in, in 2015. They did this survey to kind of figure out what things in the household are using the most electricity. And so <clears throat> when, when they kind of broke it down, you can see that air conditioning and heating, right, are the, are the biggest uses. Um, and then you go down to water heating, refrigerators, lighting, TVs, clothes dryers, and then everything else is kind of lumped into these other areas. Um, so, so when we talk about ways to reduce our consumption of energy in the home, you know, it's good to talk about things like getting more energy efficient light bulbs, right? But light bulbs are really only a small portion um, about 10% of, of what we're using that electricity for at home. S again, space heating, water heating, air conditioning are about 50% of our home energy use. So those are going to be the things that are going to have the biggest bang for the buck, so to speak, if you can increase your efficiency in, in those areas, um, then, then you're going to have uh, a, a greater impact on your greenhouse gas reduction. So what are some of the 
broader implications of our energy consumption at home. Let's step back and, and look um, more at the macro scale. Here in Florida in 2017, about 87% of the natural gas delivered to consumers was used to generate electricity. So if you look over here at the Florida electric utility generation chart, this is also from um, <coughs> the Energy Information Administration, you can see 2008 to 2018, we've had a significant increase in the amount of natural gas um, in Florida that's being used for electric utility generation. Um, it's good that we are moving away from coal and oil, right? Mainly because coal and oil tend to have um, much more particulate matter and uh, are, it's more difficult to, to clean um, clean the um, uh, <clears throat> gases um, out of <clears throat> what comes out when you burn the coal. Um, and so, and it's also harder to use some of those things that are, that are filtered out. Uh, so with natural gas, it tends to burn a little bit cleaner, right? And, and so you still have carbon dioxide emissions, but you don't have as much particulate matter. And so that's, that's a really good thing to think about. Um, now, one of the things that, that I hear from people all the time is, well, we live in the Sunshine State, right? How, how does solar factor into our percentage, right? Well, um, currently uh, it's less than 10% that of all of our um, electric generation here in the state comes from what we consider renewable sources. So things like solar, um, whether it's photovoltaics or solar thermal. Um, we don't really have any hydropower here, but there are some, some places that consider renewable sources such as um, the use of uh, organic material to create electricity. For instance, um, burning of pulp wood uh, that is kind of discarded through the forestry industry. Um, <clears throat> so some of those types of things uh, are incorporated in other states, mostly here in Florida. It is solar when we're talking about renewable energy, but here uh, we don't really have a large percentage yet. Um, FPL does currently operate 18 large solar power plants and has plans to install 30 million solar plan panels by 2030. So within the next 10 years, we should see more photovoltaics um, coming into play. Um, and that one thing that's good is that in the next year or so, we are set to see solar because of these new installations outpace coal and oil in Florida at by percentage for energy production. So the majority of our electrical generation is still going to come from natural gas, which is a non-renewable resource, um, but we will see solar kind of overtake coal and oil um, it, in, in the percentage of, of utility generation in the next couple of years as more of these solar installations are, are coming on board. Um, I do wanna take this opportunity to mention to folks that I have disabled the chat, but if you have any questions as we go along, go ahead and type them in the Q&A and I'll either get to them at the end or try to address them as we go. So um, along with this idea of where are electricity is actually coming from, right? So, so what is actually being burned or um, what, what is actually creating the energy that we're using? Besides that point, uh, greenhouse gases, we can also look at <clears throat> the impact of centralized systems versus decentralized systems um, and their impact on greenhouse gas emissions. When you have a centralized system, you can see this is the top um, diagram here, you have an off-site power plant that uses transmission lines to bring that energy from that off-site wow. power plant to individual homes. Um, these have significant issues as far as resiliency is concerned um, with um, things like hurricanes. You know, I think we saw a lot of this when we looked at Puerto Rico um, in the last couple years when uh, there were significant damage to transmission lines and lack of access to decentralized power sources. So these centralized um, power sources, obviously I think we probably all know that as electricity is trans transmitted through transmission lines, there's some amount of loss, right? So um, 
even in highly efficient systems, there's still going to be some amount of loss from, from that offsite power plant to the home. And so that's an inefficiency that is going to lead to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, now, decentralized, the idea is you either have neighborhood hubs or you have electrical generation actually at the individual property. And with those types of systems, you increase resiliency because you're not relying on transmission lines um, for the uh, to get the electricity from that offsite power plant uh, to your home. Um, and you can, you can uh, be more independent of that power grid if there are things like major fluctuations related to, um, uh, you know, times of high heat like we're in now. This afternoon we have another heat advisory. People are gonna be really cranking their air conditioning. Uh, it puts a lot of stress on the system. So with decentralized uh, electrical systems, you have a little bit more independence and you're not necessarily connected to, um, to the main power grid if something were to fail because of high temperatures. So, <laughs> to bring it back to, um, I think I think we could probably have a really interesting long conversation about centralized and decentralized power systems. Um, but to bring it back to greenhouse gas emissions, when we talk about home energy use, for each kilowatt hour generated in the United States, an average of about one pound of CO2 is released at the power plant. So the average American household is about 909 kilowatt hours per month. So you can see how the individual usage that we have um, in our homes can really lead to a significant amount of CO2 being released at that um, power plant. And this is based on research from the annual energy outlook from this year. So, um, so, so we can see that 909 kilowatt hours per month could lead up to about 900 pounds of CO2 uh, per household, right? That's a lot of greenhouse gases being uh, released into our atmosphere and, and could lead to potential increases in, in the catastrophic effects of climate change. So thinking about how can we um, as individuals reduce our energy uh, in our homes. Um, you can look here, this is kind of a, a, an example of the billion kilowatt hours uh, based on certain end uses. So some things are higher, right? Space, we already talked about this, 50% of our household energy use is gonna be devoted to that space cooling, space heating, and water heating. Next highest is gonna be refrigeration and then lighting. And we'll talk about some specific recommendations for how to reduce these greenhouse gases. <laughs> so I want to take a, a chance to, um, we have, we have uh, a limited amount of people in the audience today. So I'm going to go ahead and ask you, I opened up chat. You can send a message to me now through the chat. <clears throat> what do you think is the most important step you could take today that would cost you no money to reduce your greenhouse gas emissions at home. Go ahead and type it into the chat and it'll come to me and I'll be able to see it. So again, that's what is the most important thing you could do today that would cost no money that would reduce your greenhouse gas emissions at home. I'll give you a, a minute to type it in. You should be able to chat um, just with me. Okay, so we have one individual um, talking about changing the temperature on their water heater. Good. So again, um, water heater is going to be below some of, um, you know, it's, it's not going to be in that same category as the 50% space heating. Um, water heating <clears throat> is, is um, important. Okay, good. Yep. A lot of you have said setting the AC higher when you leave your house. Absolutely. I think that that is one of the most impactful and um, cheapest, <laughs> uh, it actually saves you money, right? Uh, most impactful um, 
action that you could take today would be to to set your thermostat higher when you leave the house and i'll and i'll give you some recommendations um based on some research as to as to a good temperature right okay i'm gonna go ahead and turn the chat back off <clears throat> Again, if you have questions as we go along now that the chat's off, feel free to enter it into the Q&A. So one of the things that you can do um, to help when you first kind of get on this path to action, right, to, to taking steps at home, is you can go ahead and you can actually calculate your home energy use footprint. You're gonna need to have your uh, most recent electrical utility bill in front of you so you can see your kilowatt hour use and things like that. But it's definitely a really good opportunity for you to do some self evaluation and, and figure out really what is my carbon footprint based on um, the, the actions that I'm currently taking at home. So um, this <clears throat> link right here um, and, and it'll be again at the end, uh, will we'll take you to the um, uh, calculator where you can enter this information. And what I can do at the end is, if you want me to, I can go ahead and copy it and, and paste it into the chat box so that you can click directly on it. So what are no cost actions, right? We want to know what, what's the minimum um, kind of effort and expenditure first, right? Because not all of these actions are going to be accessible for everyone, but some things are no or very, very low cost. And some of the actions are actually going to save you money. So one of the first um, most impactful things you can do is to turn your AC up um, when you're out of the house, um, particularly in the afternoon, right? When you're, when it's going to be really hot. I think this afternoon the heat advisory is for somewhere around 110 degrees. So your, your air conditioner is going to be working really hard, especially if you have it set to 68 or something like that. Um, so the recommendation is for your AC to be set to 78 degrees or higher in the summer. Um, now this can be done really effectively, and we'll talk about that in the medium cost actions, but if you can um, change your thermostat, uh, get maybe a digital thermostat that's programmable or even a smart thermostat. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So again, general recommendation is gonna be 78 or higher in the summer and then 68 or lower in the winter. Um, shade your windows. If you have west facing windows, that's gonna be uh, the hottest, right? That's, you get that direct afternoon sun from west facing windows. So try to, to make sure that you have good shade for those windows. That can, that can be as simple as, you know, I'm, I mean, you can buy blackout curtains at, um, at Big Lots for like 10 bucks, I've done it. <clears throat> um, blackout curtains are great for those west facing windows. They really block a lot of energy from coming into your house. They're gonna make your AC run more efficiently. For ceiling fans, right? They're great at helping you feel cooler, um, but you wanna make sure that you're running them in an efficient manner. The general recommendation is that you run them clockwise in winter um, because it's gonna blow that hot air from the ceiling down to the floor and counterclockwise in the summer is gonna pull the hot air from ground level and, and go up to the ceiling. Now, if you have um, you know, ceilings that are 10 feet or less, the importance of, of changing the direction of your, of your ceiling fan blades is, is questionable, but it is, a, um, it is an option. Um, if you have exhaust fans in your bathroom, use them. Um, <clears throat> they help to remove the humidity from the bathroom, and that, I mean, that's good for a number of reasons, right? But one of the main reasons it, in this um, scenario is that it is going to help your AC work more efficiently because your AC doesn't have to dry out the air before it cools the air, right? So if you remove the humidity from the bathroom with the exhaust fan and then turn it off so that it's not being run when you don't need it, that, that can also help as well. With lighting, the, the best no cost action you can take is just turn them off. Right? Turn them off when you leave the room. You don't need to have lights running all the time um, in rooms that you're not in. And I know I, I have 
two small children, making sure lights are off when um, they leave the room. Sometimes it's tough, but you, you know, you try to re reinforce those behaviors early. Some other no cost actions you can take. With your refrigerator, you wanna make sure that you're checking the air seals. Make sure that there's not, um, I know occasionally I've gotten like a, uh, like a bag or, um, you know, something that gets in between the air, the seal on the door when I close the door. And just that little bit of something, like a piece of paper or a corner of a plastic bag, if, it, if it's in that, that seal there, then um, you're going to cause the refrigerator to work a whole lot harder. And you may end up causing it to, you know, to freeze up the coil in the back. So make sure that you check your air seals, clean them too. Uh, sometimes you can get food that drips. I know I've I, I'm a busy mom, fridge isn't always as clean as I'd like it to be, but sometimes you gotta check those seals, make sure they're nice and clean, because again, those can allow some of that um, outside air to get in. Your refrigerator is working overtime then, and it's using more energy. Try to set it at 38 to 40 degrees. <clears throat> For your freezer, you wanna try to make sure to keep it nice and full, right? Because the less full a freezer is, the more energy it's gonna work to keep those things cold. If you don't keep many things in your freezer, a really good option is to freeze water jugs. Um, that's good for a number of reasons for us in the summer, right? It's good hurricane prep. You've got nice cold water, uh, drinking water already stored away, but it's also going to make your freezer um, work more effectively and more efficiently. So that's a good no cost action for your freezer. Dishwasher, make sure that you're running it when it's full. Don't only, you know, put half a load of dishes in and then run it. Um, and then also turn it off before it uses the, um, the heat dry cycle because that uses a large amount of electricity. So if, if you can, um, go ahead and just run the load and then let it air dry. Uh, it's already in there in a rack. You can crack the door open a little bit. Let it, let it air dry. Um, for your clothes washer, make sure again that you're using full loads. And then when you can, right, sometimes there are some loads of laundry, you got to use hot water, but if you can use cold water because heating up that water is going to be the most um, energy intensive thing that your washing machine does. So <clears throat> use full loads, cold water when possible. And for your clothes dryer, it, it's funny, you know, we, we talk with the clothes washer, you want to make sure that you've got a full load. But with your clothes dryer, it'll actually work a little bit more efficiently if you don't overload it. You want to make sure um, that you're giving enough space in there for it to work. And clean your lint trap. Um, this is a safety thing, but it's also important for efficiency. Um, I know not and not just the one at the front, right, either. Check your duct that goes um, to exhaust uh, the, uh, the heat through the house um, because that duct can get full of some lint as well. And as that fills up, not only is it a fire hazard, but it, but it also can lead to inefficiency in, in your clothes dryer and increased energy usage. So those are no cost actions, right? Those are things that you could do today that don't cost anything, that will lower your energy usage and could potentially save you money. Some things that uh, have a little bit um, a little bit of cost associated with them. These these I kind of lump together in like low to medium cost actions. Things like lighting. Um, looking at your current lighting and replacing with high efficiency um, compact fluorescents or LEDs, so CFLs or LEDs, where you can. Right. I know some of the the like dimmable LEDs are pretty expensive still, but if you can kind of phase them in um, as they go on sale, that's a really good low to medium cost action. Um, make sure that you're performing your appropriate air conditioning maintenance, cleaning and replacing filters on a monthly basis. Um, some air conditioners and thermostats will work together to remind you when you need to change your filter. I know um, if you have a smart uh, thermostat, you'll get a little reminder on the screen that says, hey, it's time to change your filter. And that's really helpful. If you don't have a smart thermostat, you can talk into your smartphone and say, hey, set a reminder uh, each month on Friday of the first, check air conditioning filter, right? So you can get that reminder to go check 
your AC filter and make sure that you don't need to replace it. Um, for your thermostat, <clears throat> there are a lot of different options out there. Uh, digital thermostats are pretty approachable in price, um, and there are some of those that are programmable so that you could say, um, set your, your air conditioning to a higher temperature at a certain time. Smart thermostats uh, are, are nice because you don't have to think about it. Um, you set it up, it, it knows when you're away and when you're home because you can communicate, it, uh, communicate with it with your smartphone and um, it's going to automatically, like ours will automatically bump our AC up to 81 around noon and then it keeps it there until about four and then it knows that we're starting to come home from, from school and work around four and that's when it kicks it down to 78 so that it cools it down by the time we get home. Um, when you are installing your thermostat, keep it away from a sunny window, um, lamps, or other items that might produce heat because that can um, influence, um, that, that can influence, you know, if, if it's set to run at a certain temperature, it's gonna, um, it's gonna influence when that AC is running. Um, checking for weatherization. If you have an older home in particular, this is very important. Uh, make sure that you look around your doors and windows, see if you need to add any weather stripping. Um, do you need to replace any caulks or seals? Um, are, there <coughs> are there places where maybe your door isn't hanging quite right and you have a little bit more space? Um, check for those types of things. Those should be low to medium. Um, cost and also effort to, to fix, but they can have a huge impact. And then again, shading windows. This is going to be low to medium, depending on how fancy you want to get with your window treatments. Um, you can have blinds, curtains, solar screens, shutters, awnings. Um, I, I definitely like the idea of using um, blackout curtains on those west facing windows because it is going to block a, a large amount of heat from coming into your home on, on those hot afternoons. Another option, and we'll talk about this when we get into our landscapes module, but planting trees and other um, shrubs, large shrubs that can help shade that west facing side of your home or the south facing side of your home, that's gonna do a really um, great job of providing shade to your house and it's gonna make your air conditioner work more efficiently. You can even plant trees that will shade your AC um, and, and that, can, that can help it work more efficiently as well. So, um, Think about ways that you could change maybe your outside landscape to provide more shade to your home so that you don't have to work so hard um, to, to cool it down. Now some of these <coughs> moderate to high cost actions are going to be inaccessible to some individuals, right? This is also going to depend on whether or not you own your home. So for the no cost and low to medium cost, those actions are approachable um, from a money perspective. They're also approachable from it. They're just easy, right? They're easy things for us to do. And they're, um, they're things that you can do if you rent your home rather than owning a home. Now, some of the moderate to high cost actions, you aren't gonna be able to do these unless you own your house. And there is a significant price outlay for, for many of, of these suggestions, but they can have a significant impact to save you money down the line. Um, so looking at, at one of the first things you can do is to review, um, check your attic insulation. What is the rating of your attic insulation do you have a sufficient amount of insulation in your attic? Um, the recommendation is gonna to be to get up to an R30 or higher. And an R30 is just a, is, that's the number that is going to tell you how, how good that insulation is at insulating, basically. And the higher the number, the, the greater the insulation um, of that type of material. So you want to upgrade to an R30 or higher in your attic if um, you don't have that already. And then, and then really check and see, make sure that you have it at the correct thickness um, uh, throughout your attic. 
Um, some things like that, that are not on here, but also if you don't have an attic fan, um, that, that could be uh, something that you could install that could improve the efficiency of your, of your air conditioner as well. Maybe installing an attic fan, keeping that space a little bit cooler um, could, could help as well. Um, your windows. This is for people who um, have the ability to change out a window or maybe a window gets broken and they need to replace it. Look for dual pane windows. Um, you want to make sure to get the dual pane because they, what they have is, is it's two panes of glass and the space in between those two panes of glass acts as insulation. So you end up with this little insulating barrier in your windows rather than a single pane of glass that's exchanging energy um, with the outside air. So you think about how uh, you can touch your hand to a sunny window and if it's a single pane window you're going to feel that heat pretty significantly but a dual pane window you really shouldn't feel much different um, than, than the ambient temperature in the room. So look for those dual pane windows. And there's, there are you know, different grades that you can get that'll cost more or less money, but definitely just look for that dual pane. Um, <clears throat> if your AC system is more than 10 years old, think about replacing it. Uh, it's gonna be much more efficient if you get something newer, particularly if you find something that's Energy Star rated. Um, and and if you're undertaking that, that would be a really good time to look at your ducts and make sure that you don't have any leaks in your ducts. So, um, and even before you go to that step to replace your air conditioning system, one of the, you know, we talk a lot about efficiency, right? If you have leaks in your duct system, then your air conditioner is working much harder than it needs to. So hire a professional who can check for leaks in your ducts and get those, um, get those repaired. With your water heater, now this is going to be um, individuals that have a, uh, a traditional water heater that have a tank of water. If it is not insulated, I highly recommend insulating it. Um, replace it if it's more than 10 years old is a, a good option. Um, some tankless hot water heaters can be more efficient than than the ones um, that have tanks, but definitely look at the at the relative um, <coughs> look at the relative energy uses between them. And really, the tankless hot water heaters are are excellent for space consideration. If you if you don't have a large space to hold a water tank, those tankless hot water heaters can can do a really good job um, of saving you some space. And if you use it in conjunction with a solar water heater, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, they can be they can be quite efficient. Try to set them to 120 degrees or less. Um, that's going to save you some energy as well. If you're in need of a new refrigerator, check Energy Star options when replacing. So look for something that's gonna be energy efficient. Um, I wouldn't normally recommend, you know, if you have a refrigerator and it's working, don't just go and check it and get a new one because you think you need to buy something that's, that's Energy Star rated. If you have a refrigerator, just do what you can to, to make it as efficient as possible while you have it, and then replace it when you need to, right? We'll talk about consumption in one of our modules, and, it, and it's important to recognize that just because we're making recommendations um, for certain kinds of products, um, purchasing products is not necessarily gonna be the, the end um, that will give us the best result for greenhouse gases. So, so don't just go out and check your refrigerator and get an Energy Star one if the current refrigerator you have works, right? Um, and again, with your clothes washer, look for those Energy Star options as well. One of the things I would recommend is checking for a washing machine that has the ability to, to tell um, how, how much uh, how many clothes you have in it or, or how much laundry is, is in the basket. Um, because if you can get a washing machine that only puts as much water in as you need, rather than filling the whole basket when you only have like say a half load, um, that's gonna do a lot for, for water and energy savings. All right, I don't see any questions in the Q&A, so I'm gonna keep moving right ahead. Um, <coughs> so, 
for heating and cooling specifically, we've talked about the AC a little bit. Um, if anybody has these, you know, window units, I know they can't always be avoided, but something to consider um, other than these window units, because these are very inefficient, is to um, consider something called a mini split, which is actually quite efficient. Um, and, and they can be a little bit more expensive, but if you're, if you're in a situation where you can't install a brand new AC for the whole house, um, you don't have enough money to do that, a mini split's gonna be cheaper than that and it's gonna be much more efficient. So that's something I would, I would recommend if you're in that situation. Um, there are five primary factors that are going to uh, influence the amount of energy used for heating and cooling. So the desired temperature of the home is number one, right? Are you somebody that has to be chilly? <laughs> Even when it's 98 degrees outside in Florida, you have to be chilly, so you, you set your temperature down pretty low. Um, that's gonna influence the amount of energy the amount of time the house needs to be kept at that temperature. So if you run your house chilly all the time, all day long, that's gonna change and increase the amount of energy used, right? Um, the amount of space being cooled or heated. If you have a very large house, it's, it's going to take more energy. If you have a very small house, it's gonna take less energy. Um, and then the efficiency of your cooling or heating system, which, I would actually say kind of plays into that last bullet, which is the insulation and airflow of the building. If you live in a 1920s house, you're gonna have leaks. Um, it's gonna be hard to prevent that from happening. So the amount of energy you have to use to cool and heat your home, it, it's gonna be more than somebody who lives in a new, especially if you're talking about like a, a concrete block construction house, right? Those are gonna be very efficient, um, but there are things that you can do, which we've already talked about, um, that can increase the efficiency, even in those situations where you live in, in an older home. Um, placing furniture to take advantage of ducts. So if you know that um, you like to be chilly when you're watching a movie, put your couch so that the vent is blowing in your direction when you're laying on the couch at night, right? Because if you set, if you if you put your couch, your um, you know your chill out spot far away from that air conditioning vent, and you don't feel the air, you're going to be more likely to turn down the AC. So place your furniture to take advantage of those. Uh, again, clean and replace filters frequently. <coughs> check all of your seals and get necessary maintenance. And then also again check windows and doors. Apply weather stripping because that's going to help. Um, with some of those leaky situations. So just a few more um, tips and tricks for, for home energy usage. Things like, you know, the, these aren't in the big, um, the big three that kind of take up about half of our energy uses, but for those other, um, other things that, that, that do use energy in our homes, cooking is, is pretty high up there. So one of the things you can think about when cooking is to use small appliances when possible. So things like microwaves and toaster ovens, those are, those are very um, efficient when you're cooking a small amount of food. Uh, don't be afraid of microwaves. They, they are very energy efficient for, for what you need to do. Now certain foods obviously don't taste good if you cook them in the microwave, but um, you, can, you can certainly use them when appropriate and don't be afraid of them from an energy uh, perspective. They are very efficient. Um, covering your pots and pans with lids, right? You're gonna heat up the water much quicker if you put a lid on your pot than if you leave the lid off. And, and take advantage of the energy that you're using to cook more than one thing at once. So, you know, if you've got, um, I'll, I'll, I'll give this example because I do this pretty frequently. If you're cooking dinner and you're like roasting some vegetables and you also need to bake a loaf of bread, right? Do those two things simultaneously so that, um, you know, so that, so that you're using that energy without turning the stove off, turning it back on again later, getting it back up to temperature, and then baking your loaf of bread. So take advantage of the opportunity to cook multiple things at once. Um, as far as your entertainment equipment is concerned, <coughs> um, receivers that, uh, you know, you plug your television audio into, you plug your speakers into, it runs AM, FM radio, um, if you turn those off completely, even unplugging them when you're not using them, 
that's going to save a lot of energy. Those do kind of trickle. Um, they're, they're what we would call vampires, energy vampires, right? So you might not be using them, but they still have an LED light displaying that they're off. They're still going to be pulling some amount of electricity. So if you can, you know, remember to turn off, unplug those things, especially again, if they have just like, if, if they're keeping that little red LED on, that means that they're still pulling electricity. Now, it's not a large amount of electricity, but it's some. And it's something that you can do to, to kind of lessen that, um, those energy vampires. Um, if, you're, if you're purchasing a new television and you're gonna be getting, uh, I don't know that anybody buys anything but a flat screen now, um, but if you're gonna be getting, um, just to say, I, I don't know that I've seen new televisions that aren't flat screens. Um, if, if you are looking to purchase a new television, Think about a, an LCD flat screen rather than a plasma screen. Plasma screens are going to use more electricity than an LCD screen. Um, if you have a swimming pool, try to use a solar water heater um, or, or even a solar pump if, if you can. And then also research has shown that your pool will stay just as clean if you only pump it four hours a day as compared to eight hours a day. So, um, obviously that can change if you know, your pool is not covered in there's a um, heavy wind or rain or something like that. You may need to, to up um, how much you're pumping, but, but you can reduce, you can safely reduce that pumping to four hours a day and that's going to save a lot of energy as well. So we're going to talk a little bit about renewable energy here in a minute, but I kind of wanted to go back to a couple of these, um, in particular decentralization of grids. These are kind of hot topics in the home energy use field right now. Here in Florida, there's a lot of talk around community solar and solar co-ops. And this is kind of going hand in hand with this idea of decentralized grids, right? So as we have more community solar, more solar co-ops that are happening, um, there's a greater push to create more decentralized electrical grids. And this is being pushed both from, you know, just solar advocates in the community, um, but it's also, you know, looking at a uh, storm resiliency perspective. It's, it's a really good thing to consider as we look at, you know, the future implications of climate change as far as you know, potential rolling blackouts due to increased use of, of AC, um, looking at increased frequency and intensity of Atlantic storms. You know, these are all things that we talked about in the last class that are potential um, implications that we're already seeing um, from climate change. So <clears throat> community solar is a way to engage neighbors um, and, and, and kind of lead that decentralization and, and really helps with that um, personal resiliency and community resiliency in the, in the face of climate change. And then something that I wanted to, um, I wanted to touch on because I think that it's really important to acknowledge that when we're talking about home energy use, we need to acknowledge the fact that not everyone has the same access to efficiency, right? It's not equitable because housing is not equitable and the ability of individuals to um, access the resources that they need to, to upgrade their homes or to make them more efficient is, is not going to be equitable. So there are programs out there <coughs> that are working with local communities to try to provide resources to increase that equitability of efficiency. So how do we work with landlords to uh, get them to do kind of energy efficient upgrades to their homes? Um, what can we do to provide information to folks throughout the entire community on some of these individual actions that could, you know, while while I might be interested in greenhouse gas emissions, I'm also interested in how I can save money on my electric bill, right? Because we, in Florida, I'm sure we all have seen that, you know, edging up close to $200 electric bill, um, you know, in the summer. I, my house is very modest um, and I can keep it below too, but some people are, are much higher than that. So that's a large chunk of money 
that people have to outlay. And if, and if there's a way that we can help them reduce that strain where they can focus more on, on other aspects of their lives, that, that's going to be um, an important thing that we can do. So, so these are just um, a few hot topics that I wanted to bring up. Any questions? before we, we've got just a few more slides on renewable energy and then we will be done, I think by three. Any questions? Okay. So <clears throat> what is renewable energy? Um, a renewable energy source is going to be one that does not rely on uh, the geologic time scale to make that resource available again. So when we think about coal and oil and natural gas, these are non-renewable resources because it takes millions of years for them to form, right? We're not saying that there will never be more coal and oil and natural gas, um, but what we're saying is that it's not a feasible um, resource for us to look at regeneration within any our lifetime, right? Or even a million human lifetimes. Um, so <clears throat> renewable energy is going to rely on things that don't use fossil fuels. So you're looking at solar, you're looking at um, hydroelectricity, wind power, uh, things like some types of, of biofuels are going to be considered renewable energy as well. Um, so um, here in, in Florida, I think we can all agree that we have an abundance of one of those types of renewable energy sources, and that is the sun. <coughs> but in 2018, only 3% of our energy generation came from renewable sources. And um, there can be a lot of discussion as to why that's the case. Um, but I think one of, the, one of the main things is just that when our grid was created, when our, when our current electrical grid was created, these renewable sources weren't really um, being considered. Um, and, and so, you know, now, especially over the last 10 years or so, we've seen this uptick in natural gas use, which again is good because we're not burning coal, but, um, but we haven't seen as precipitous a rise in the use of renewable energy, mainly because there's a lot more infrastructure that would need to be added um, in order to, to make it viable. Um, I'm not saying that it's not cost efficient um, because now photovoltaics in particular have gotten, have gotten really um, uh, reasonably priced, right? Especially if you're, if you're looking at utility grade uh, solar arrays. But, um, uh, but I think that there's a lot of consideration about transmission and how you get that energy from those locations to the homes, um, because if you rely on that old model of, you know, solar or power plant over here, house over here, got to get the energy from there to here, um, it, it becomes more challenging. And so this is where I think the, the argument for more decentralized um, power it, is really starting to come into the conversation. Um, even though we're known as the sunshine state, we're fifth in the nation for our total installed solar power. Um, we have currently enough solar power to power 401,000 homes um, in the state. We do have a lot of solar power installations, over 42,000, um, but we do have a ton of growth potential. <coughs> um, so we, we we have been looking at this much more um, in the last few years, and over the next five years, there's a there's a um, nearly 5.5 gigawatts expected to come online of solar. And so, you know, we know what a kilowatt is, right? A gigawatt um, is 100 kilowatt. Yeah, <laughs> got to do my metric math there. Um, so, so we're looking at 5.5 gigawatts of solar electricity um, expected to come online in the next five years in Florida. So that's great. Um, we're happy about that. But how do we how do we know whether we're getting solar power at our house? Um, and that's where you have to go to your electric utility, and they should have a breakdown percentage-wise of where your energy is coming from. 
Now, there are options out there. Um, there are different kinds of organizations and companies that will um, allow you to buy into solar or wind generation. So for instance, um, you could route your electric, you connect your electric utility to, the, to said organization, and they would say, okay, for a fee of $10 a month, we will offset your electric usage based on what your utility company provides to us with um, solar energy that's being produced in some other state. Um, so there are options to do things like that, to try to offset some of, of your energy usage um, with these different types of sources. Um, but I think that, you know, we have to think about, okay, so I'm doing something in Arizona to increase their solar capacity, but I'm, I'm not doing it here in Florida. Um, and so how, how effective is that for me locally in regards to things like air quality, et cetera. There are a number of incentives available for folks um, in Florida, uh, as well as just in, in the United States in general. If you go to this database of state incentives for renewables and efficiency, um, they're going to be able to tell you what incentives are currently offered in your area. Um, Florida alone has 101 different incentives, either uh, from the state or from the feds. Um, <clears throat> some of those things are things like sales tax incentives, property tax. Um, there are some rebate programs still out there, loan programs and grant programs for, for upgrading your home. So um, to dive into that a little bit deeper, in Florida we have the sales and use tax is waived. Uh, for solar energy systems, including solar hot water heating, solar space heaters, photovoltaics, and solar pool heating. So even if you wanted to um, just purchase a solar pool heater, you could, um, you could purchase one without sales or use tax. The PACE program was passed in 2010. It's the Property Assessed Clean Energy Legislation. And this is gonna offer long-term fixed rate financing to cover 100% of the costs involved with energy efficiency, water conservation, renewable energy generation, and resiliency upgrades. So if you're looking at doing a, um, a high cost installation to your home to, to rehab it either for resiliency, water conservation, or you're looking at installing photovoltaics, this is an option for you to get a loan um, that has fixed rate financing um, over the life of the loan. And uh, another program as well is SELF, the Solar and Energy Loan Fund. It's a nonprofit organization that provides unsecured personal loans for a variety of green home renovations. So that can include things like photovoltaic, solar hot water heaters, solar pool pumps, water conservation, etc. cetera. Um, you know, when we talk about specifically dealing with solar for your home, if you're, you know, if you own your home and you're thinking about solar, you want to think about um, whether solar is going to make sense for you. So one of the biggest things you want to look at is look at your roof um, and determine whether or not it receives west uh, or south facing um, whether, whether it has a south or west facing uh, roof. Um, ideally, you want it to be south, could be west, you want it to be unshaded exposure for the entire day. Um, and also, if you're considering installing photovoltaics, check your roof if it hasn't been um, replaced in 15 years or more, you should probably consider getting your roof done prior to installation of your photovoltaics, or you could do them at the same time, um, just so that you, you make sure that your roof is, is stable enough to support the photovoltaics. If you have a large amount of property um, and your roof isn't quite right for photovoltaics, and let's say you live, um, let's say you have a couple acres and you have an area that used to be pasture, you probably have a great wide open area to do an on-ground solar array, and, and that um, could then be routed to your house to power your home. Um, solar co-ops are a great way to kind of help offset some of the expenses related to 
purchasing photovoltaics. So they have gone down significantly in price, depending on who you're going with, they're gonna quote you at different prices um, per kilowatt hour. Um, you know, we looked at it for my home and it didn't make sense because of the amount of shade that we had uh, from our large oak tree that we're not <laughs> willing to cut down. Um, <coughs> And uh, I think it was going to be around about $18,000 for the install and everything. Um, so for some people, that's really reasonable. For other people, it's not even close to reasonable. But what a solar co-op will do is a solar co-op will allow you to go in with a lot of folks and get bulk pricing um, and installation while still signing individual contracts with the, um, with the installer. Um, if you aren't ready to make the jump to photovoltaics and maybe you just want to think about a solar hot water heater, that's a great option as well. Um, you can, you know, think about things like whether you want an active system or a passive system. Do you have enough elevation where you would install it that a passive system would, would be efficient? Or do you need to have something that's got pumps and things like that pushing the water along? Um, whether you have two tanks or one, so there are some solar hot water heaters where the water is heated up in, in one tank and then it's pushed through a, a standard water heater. And in that case, what's happening is the water is kind of preheated before it goes into your standard water heater and that increases the efficiency of your water heater and, and it then uses less energy. And that, that's a really good combination if you can get the if you can if you can go with your kind of active solar water heater to a tankless uh, situation then um, then you can really have, have a pretty efficient system that way um, some of the solar water heaters will kind of include <coughs> will be all in one um, but but it just kind of depends on on how much how much water you, you use and, and and those kinds of considerations and how much money you're willing to spend as well so we're going to end just with a quick discussion on biofuels and and how they're how they're different um, and biofuels are alternatives or additives to fossil based fuels made from organic materials so this means that there's something that we can we can add to oil right um, to gasoline to to kind of just change that amount of oil or gas that we're that we're using. So we're using just a little bit less. Um, you know, a good example of this is is ethanol in gasoline, right? You can get the uh, E85, um, or you can, you know, I know in some places in the country you can actually buy um, full 100% ethanol. Um, these are generally made from corn or sugarcane. Uh, and this is going to be kind of byproduct of the agricultural industry. There's a lot of misconceptions out there and conversation around redirecting potential food products to, um, to these uses, to biofuel uses. But one thing that I want to make sure everybody understands is that um, for the most part, you're not taking something that humans or animals would eat. Um, you're going to be taking byproducts only and then going through a fermentation process to create ethanol. Other things can be used besides corn or sugarcane. Um, I know uh, there are some folks up at the University of South Florida who are working on algae biofuels. Um, so growing algae in basically big plastic bags and then fermenting them and, and um, creating ethanol with them. Um, there are other options as well, things like biodiesel. So I'm sure you may or may not have seen people with a, like an old Saab or VW or something that, that was a diesel vehicle that they've converted over to biodiesel. Um, they kind of smell like French fries when they drive by, uh, mainly because they rely on spent cooking oil. And they, they can go through a, a refining process with that spent cooking oil and then use it as a, as a biodiesel. Um, so those are just some examples and, and the reason that this comes into play for home energy use is there can be some, um, there can be some offset uh, of our electricity generation through the use of biofuels. But I want to make sure that we, we draw a distinction between biofuels and things like um, biochar, which is, um, those are going to be uh, 
kind of byproducts of the forestry industry that are essentially just turned into a charcoal product that are then burned. So um, those have same kind of issues as far as particulate matter emissions as, as things like coal do. So, um, so biofuels, um, generally when we use that term, we're going to be talking about something that's going to offset the amount of oil or gasoline. And, and that can affect uh, the percentages of electricity generation for, um, for home use. And that's kind of where I wanted to end today. I did just want to, you know, remind everybody, this is, there are some steps that do cost money, right? But for the, for the most part, when we are talking about home energy use, we can really take small individual actions that can have a major impact on, on our home's energy use. And I would challenge you um, as folks who are making yourselves more informed and learning about these, these choices that you can make, change some of these things that I've recommended today. Look at your thermostat, turn your AC up a little bit, see if you don't save money. Because I think something that gets lost in, in a lot of our, um, you know, quote unquote environmental message is that, you know, we can save money and save the environment. And, and this is one of the easiest ways to kind of highlight how that can happen. And so, so really, I challenge you, take what you've learned today, apply it to your home energy use, send me an email and let me know what you found out. That would be um, a great, a great opportunity for me to kind of see what your personal experiences are. Um, and again, our next, um, our next meeting will be next week on Thursday, and we're going to be talking about green building and transportation. So ways that we can kind of change the physical built environment to help reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And there are some resources here and more. And these are the climate smart contacts. If you have any um, questions about the climate smart curriculum. Um, these are the folks who originally developed the curriculum. So you can uh, reach out to them if you'd like. Um, but again, if you're interested in any incentives, here's a list <coughs> of some of the um, organizations that are responsible for um, some of our incentives. And um, if you're interested, the so here is the um, I'm going to stop my share for just a second so I can send you in the chat the <clears throat> link to the um, home energy saver calculator. There you go. You should see that in your chat box. And if there aren't any questions, we'll go ahead and end for today. All right. Okay. Have a great day, everyone.